All right, we are going to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Seema Kari from Supporting Inclusive Practices through Riverside County Office of Education. And I have my colleagues online here, Christian Brooks, all Executive Director for SIP through Riverside County Office of Education, and Kevin Schaefer through El Dorado County Office of Education. Um, and we are here, just to make sure that you're all in the right spot, we are here for UDL part two, calling all administrators and teachers to action. Um, so welcome back. This is the second part of the series, and we are very excited to have Dr. Nowak with us again today. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I start. This webinar will be recorded, and we will be posting it on our new website. And so for those of you who have asked which website, it is www.sipinclusion.org. So sipinclusion.org. We'll be posting it there and it will be available for you to view and share. Um, and then the only other point is that we, are, we have muted you all just so that we reduce the sound interference on this webinar. But please, please feel free to use the chat feature, ask questions. We'd love your participation and interaction throughout the webinar. And that's about it. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the ball to Katie. Okay, everybody. Hello, hello. I, I'm loving this chat right now. I'm getting to see that this UDL world is so much smaller than we realize. So both people who introduced themselves, we have a mutual colleague in common. And so I just love that the UDL network is spreading and that you're all becoming an important part of that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And what we're going to dive into today is the, the big like action items, you know, to answer the question, what really is UDL? Um, I think focusing a little bit more on how is it different from just this concept of differentiation or this concept of differentiated instruction, and then how do we use this framework to really create an environment that works for all students. Now, in the first webinar, we talked about creating a system that is built on a foundation of universal design for learning. So we want a really robust tier one system that truly meets the needs of all students academically, behaviorally, and socially emotionally. And to do that, we cannot provide students with a one-size-fits-all version of education because we have to embrace the fact that they're very different from each other and even they're different day to day on their own. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unpack some critical concepts of UDL and talk about some really concrete action steps that you can take in your own practice to begin to implement UDL with either your students, your learners, or your educators. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is this concept of teacher efficacy, because we're talking about really changing the way that we do business as educators. And so when we're talking about like what it's going to take to create um, a really robust system that's going to meet the needs of all learners, what we want to do is we really want to focus on this concept of what do we know works the best. Okay, so there are so many research studies out there, you know, there's, there's probably hundreds of thousands of research studies on education. And the Every Student Succeeds Act asks us to really pay attention to what it is that is the most evidence based. Now, research based is actually different from evidence based. Um, because research based means I read some research and then I kind of create a program or a framework um, and I'm like, well, that's based on the research. The difference between research based and evidence based is does it actually work when you use like a gold standard peer reviewed research study where you have a control group and a treatment group and then what is the value add? What is the effect of using a particular practice? And so um, this book, Visible Learning for Teachers, it's probably the most impressive collection of education research that has ever been done. Um, John Hattie and his colleagues, they update it periodically using all the new research that comes out that is peer reviewed from either um, journal articles or dissertation studies. And what they do is they take all the different research on, on over 200 teaching influences is what they call them. So teaching strategies, actions that we can take or things that influence student learning. And the question is, what effect does this actually have on students? And so what you do is you kind of take a treatment group and you take a control group. And what you can do is you can control for so many different variables. 
So for instance, in like a third grade class, I already know like the typical growth of those students and the typical growth for that teacher and how many years that teacher has been teaching. And then I can take this treatment group and do something different. Like I might focus the whole year on giving like 30 hours of professional development and getting students to self-report their own grades, for example, or to be really focused on feedback strategies or to be really focused on this concept of ability grouping, okay, whatever it happens to be. And then at the end, we can actually calculate the effect using something called an effect size. And I don't want to get too much in the mathematics of this, but this is a study that we really cannot argue with because it really looks at over 1,500 meta-analyses of studies that look at 80,000 peer-reviewed research studies that affect the outcomes of 300 million students. So when you're thinking about what works, what evidence do we have that this practice is effective, you want to go into visible learning. And what they do when they look at these 200 and I believe it's 290 influences or around there, um, they actually rank them. What is the most impressive or what is the highest yield? And then you go all the way down to what actually has a negative effect on student achievement. And what we know is the hinge point is a 0.4, meaning that you get about a year of growth from a, a 0.4, okay, which is the effect size. And so when you have numbers above 0.4, that's clearly something that you wanna invest your time in because that gives you more than what you'd expect a typical year of growth to be. And so the three top variables or the three top teaching influences when it comes to increasing the outcomes of students are actually really, really interesting because we spend so much time on like curriculum and assessments and looking at data and all of that is critically important. But the reality is, is teacher efficacy is the highest, highest impact on student achievement, which means a teacher who believes that they can teach all students. And so when you're thinking about this concept of efficacy, it really comes down to what beliefs teachers have about their own ability to increase the outcomes of all students. So teachers with really high feelings of efficacy are thrilled to have all students in their class because they know that they have the skills to meet the needs of all students. Um, when we know that teachers have a lower sense of efficacy, they tend to say that uh, kids can't do things. There's more of a deficit model of what kids are capable of doing. And so when we hear, oh, kids can't do that, you know, there's no way I can do that because kids can't do that. What the efficacy research tells us is what that actually translates to is I can't figure out how to get them to do that because we don't know what kids can and cannot do. That is a fact. We do not know for sure what they can and cannot do. And if we believe that a kid is not able to do something, it's because we don't figure out a way to, to figure out a pathway for them. And so when you're thinking about this concept of efficacy, you know, a very low sense of efficacy is just like the kid can't do it. Um, you know, we start to move forward, like, I feel like I'm a good teacher, but I'm ready to uh, teach kids who arrive ready to learn. Again, teaching kids who arrive ready to learn is really not that impressive of a skill, um, because kids who come being self-directed and compliant, um, they face far less barriers to learning. Um, what we want to get to a point to is that teachers have a belief that all kids can learn. And that's the first thing that we have to build if we're going to create an environment where UDL flourishes, is we have to believe that kids can do it. We have to believe that we have the ability to teach an inclusive group of students. And, and because of the professional development that I've received um, over the past decade in, in Universal Design for Learning, I have no doubt you could put me in any classroom with any group of variable kids and I would feel like I can create an environment that works for all of them. Now, really interestingly, if you look at those next two factors, it's all about self-reported grades. It's all about giving kids ownership of their own learning, allowing them to personalize a self-assessment and to be able to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are and for them to actually drive their own learning experiences. And then the teacher estimates achievement is what do we believe kids are capable of? So before we get into where are we gonna put the options, where are we gonna get the choices, you know, what are the key components of UDL? The reality is, is UDL will only be effective when teachers believe that all kids are capable of learning. Now, 
fantastically, the number one way to increase collective teacher efficacy or the belief that like together we can meet the needs of all kids is through really high quality professional development. We have to give them the tools and the strategies and the framework, which is UDL, that helps all educators to actually see that students all have the ability to become expert learners, that they can self-report their grades, that they can make choices for themselves. And when we believe that they can, they will. And so um, I want to just take you really quickly. Oh my goodness, I just lost my screen here for a second. Sharing is paused. Okay. Sorry, I just flew out of the way. There we go. Um, I want to show you a short little video on something called the Pygmalion effect. Because again, this is something that we have to address first. Because I could give you know, anybody professional development on UDL and say provide all of these options and choices to every student. But if there's this holdout, if there's this belief, but, but those students will never be able to choose for themselves or they really can't be here because of their behavior or you don't understand, you don't know these kids, okay? What we end up with is a self-fulfilling prophecy because if we don't provide students with options to learn how to make choices and to learn how to self-report their progress, they will never learn how to do it. Um, and so what I want you to think about is how the Pygmalion effect can affect teacher development and teacher outcomes um, because what we have to do is we have to create opportunities for all teachers to learn how to teach all students and that is a systems lens and so last week we talked about how do we create a system that supports UDL and we talked about these different drivers one of those drivers is a capacity driver how can we ensure that all teachers have the capacity to teach all students so they have a belief in their own teaching, which gives them higher expectation beliefs for all students. And so again, this is a very short video, it's about two minutes, and it explains this concept of, do we really believe and do we really create a system where all teachers can teach all students? So we're gonna show this video and then I'm gonna give you a minute to ask questions if you have any. So let's see, I'm gonna put on the closed captions. In this video, we are going to take a closer look at the fascinating leadership phenomenon called the Pygmalion or Rosenthal effect. It was first discovered in the classroom, but you'll find its effects everywhere. And we are going to study the Pygmalion effect using a famous army experiment. Imagine a 15 week army training course. 105 soldiers are assigned to four instructors. And before the course starts, each instructor is getting the following message. We have collected a lot of data regarding the trainees you will receive in the coming days. It considers of psychological tests, grades from previous courses and ratings by previous commanders. Based on this information, we have predicted the command potential of the soldiers you're going to receive. High are the great soldiers, regular, the average ones, and unfortunately, there is a few soldiers where we don't have any data. Please learn their names and their scores by heart before they arrive. It's important to know that at the time, these four instructors didn't know that the classification we were given are completely random. In other words, the soldier listed as High command potential could very well be the worst soldier in the group or vice versa. After the 16 weeks course, each soldier was tested. The outcome, those soldiers that got marked high command potential significantly outperformed their classmates. Those with an average command potential scored the lowest and the third group, those with an unknown performance potential, ended up in the middle. And the difference was quite big. It was 15% between the first group and the last group. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that strange? So when we believe a team member has the ability to be a great performer, our belief becomes reality. The performance expectations we have for our team members is self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the Pygmalion effect. But how does it work? In short, as soon as the instructors believed that some soldiers had better abilities than others, they started managing those individuals differently. 
raising expectations triggers a leadership process that results in superior performance. So better leadership in turn has a direct positive effect on the subordinate's performance. It kickstarts positive effects. Just imagine the extra boost you get when somebody is giving you positive attention. Leaders get the performance they expect. When we believe and expect low performance, our expectations kickstart a negative spiral that leads to low performance. But otherwise, if we can imagine everybody to be a great performance performer, if we apply a can-do management style to everyone in the team, when we believe our team members have what it takes to succeed, like those four instructors did with those soldiers with a high command potential, the chance that they will actually succeed will be much higher. So the Pygmalion effect teaches us that we have to be careful in what we believe. Most of us have the habit of labeling team members. Maria is a high performer, Joe is average, Eva reached her ceiling, and Mike is a low performer. But our labels are self-fulfilling prophecies. And for those at the end that end up in the high performance category, that's great. They'll get the leader they deserve. But for those that we categorize as average or low performer, it's not the case. Because when we don't expect greatness, our leadership style won't be either. And by doing so, we contribute to their failure. So if we want to increase our team success rate, we have to reconsider the relationship we have with all our team members, not only the ones with high command potential. We need to create a can-do environment, a place where we expect success from every team member, not only a few high performers. Leaders who believe all team members will succeed will outperform those that don't. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share on that really quickly just so I can see the, um, if you have any questions or anything in the chat box. And so again, this concept, what we really want to start with this build is like the first thing we have to do is we have to challenge our expectations about kids. Okay, before UDL can be really successful, we have to have really difficult conversations in our schools and in our systems. Do we believe all kids can learn? I know, without a doubt, I know that every teacher, given robust, really great professionally, uh, universally designed professional development, can meet the needs of all kids in the classroom. I see it in my district every single day. But you have to create an environment where the expectations are high for all learners and the expectations are high for all teachers as well. And so I like to look at that video like almost through two lenses um, because sometimes I'll work with administrators and they'll say, oh, you know, I can't put kids who are struggling in that room because that teacher doesn't do a great job. Well, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because the teacher has never been given the opportunity and the feedback and the coaching to build capacity to be really good at that. Um, to be really good at things, we have to practice. We have to put in our time. And so to do that, we have to believe in our own art as leaders because it's the same way. Is If a teacher says a student can't, it really is like, gosh, I don't know how to get them to a place where they can. And when an administrator says a teacher can't, it's the same lens is like, gosh, I don't know what to do in my leadership practice to get this person to move. And that is really what MTSS is all about, is how do we create that capacity and come up with strong leadership so we can create a system that is in fact universally designed. Um, so yes, the capacity drivers are the same things if we're looking at that outside piece, is we build teacher competency through creating capacity for teachers to meet the needs of all learners. And that has to happen from the outside in. So I see a lot of people are saying, yes, all kids can learn at high levels. Teacher capacity and efficacy are absolutely critical, but that is a precursor to UDL. Because if you go into a school or in a system and you start talking about, let's take action on UDL, we're gonna provide options and choices. Um, what I've seen happen in a lot of ways is you'll have some teachers that are like, um, I'll give options and choices to most kids, but this kid really isn't going to be able to do it. And or we basically create a system that some teachers don't teach in inclusive classrooms. And so when we create ability groups, which 
you know, when you're looking at how these effect size actually has a very, very low, low effect on student achievement, less than a year of growth by ability grouping, even with uh, gifted students. What you're realizing here is that an inclusive education that provides all students with options and choices to learn is the best for everybody. And that is actually evidence-based if you're doing it through the lens of personalized learning and options and choices. So going back really quickly to the presentation, let's see where I am. So we talked about this Pygmalion effect. We talked about this concept of um, creating uh, teacher efficacy and capacity. And then the next step is what we have to do is we have to make sure that conditions of nurture are present in every single classroom. So this concept of all kids can learn really comes out through these conditions of nurture. Okay, first of all, we create environments where we really, really focus on this concept that like you will make mistakes as learners. So there's no, there's no can, there's no can't, there's some not yet. And so when I give you options and choices as a teacher or as a learner in my classroom, I want you to know that whatever you choose, it's going to be okay. And that mistakes are actually fantastic because when you go through that process we talked about in the last webinar where you make a choice, you do that choice, and then you review it. At that review, you're going to go, oh, gosh, that didn't work for me. Okay. And that's amazing. Like, I would celebrate that in my class, being like, that is so awesome. You know, at such a young age, what doesn't work. That took me years to figure out. I'm so proud of you for recognizing that that was not a good strategy um, and that you need to do something different. But again, what we have to realize is this cannot be a classroom of compliance because things aren't always gonna go well, because learning and engagement are incredibly messy. That's why when we look at the UDL guidelines for engagement, it reminds us that students have to be able to self-regulate. They have to be able to cope with a high level of challenge and this concept of like, we're gonna make mistakes, that's a part of learning. So when teachers have high feelings of efficacy, they embrace the fact that failure is a part of learning for themselves and for their students. And they create an environment with kids that say, I will not let you fail, okay? I will not let you fail. We may have many micro failures together and I'm not gonna do things great every single day, but I promise you, I believe in myself and I believe in you and together, we're gonna make more than a year of growth, baby. Like, not even a question of that. And to do that, we're gonna try different things together and we're gonna be problem solvers and when they're not working, we're gonna do something different. But creating an environment like that allows every kid to feel like they can make choices. Um, the next thing is you have to make a real, real effort when you're building up high expectations for kids that you know what they're really good at and that you make sure the whole entire class knows that as well. Because I am much more likely to take a risk and make a mistake if I don't think I'm a total failure at everything. So taking some time at the beginning of, of every year basically saying like what are your strengths as a learner and as a friend and as a human um, and to get past the more superficial things like kids will be like oh I'm good at basketball um, but but why you know are you willing to practice for 20 minutes a day like what's your technique are you a great are you a great ball handler you know because you practice or are you really great team player because you're always like looking at the vision and you're passing because your spatial awareness is strong like what about you makes you successful. And everybody has those things. Every single person. Is it video games? Is it sports? Is it friendship? Is it loyalty? Is it attention span? All our kids have strengths. And when we recognize them, again, it helps to build expectations because we can help students use those strengths to meet their goals. And then lastly, we have to create classrooms where our kids work really, really well together. We have to have high expectations for every single student and they have to have high expectations for each other. And again, this is just about relationship building and about creating a culture that believes in learning. This is not a culture of compliance. This is not a culture that I say that every kid's going to do something and then they follow those directions because that's what computers and robots are really good at. I'm going to step back and I'm going to think about, you know what, guys, I'm going to give you options and choices in this class. And it's because I believe all of you can meet a goal and you might need to meet it in different ways. And we all have different strengths and we all have to work together and borrow each other's strengths as we work as a team. But the reality is that mess ups in this class are okay. And I will not tolerate intolerance for mistakes because that's a part of it. And we're going to celebrate it. And there'll be a prize for like the best mistake we make this week and what we learned. And creating a culture like that will get kids to take risks. You will get them to try. And they literally will start to perform in ways you would never expect because you're giving them permission to be successful in their own way.
So the conditions of nurture are really, really critical when you're thinking about building high expectations for kids and then also building efficacy in ourselves is we have to have permission to try things and figure out what works. And when I figure out things work, it starts to make me feel like I'm more effective. And when I figure out that things don't work, I have a new strategy to try something else. So um, I want to take this concept of, of efficacy and high expectations and fold it into an analogy you're probably familiar with. I use this all the time, but I think it's one of the most uh, simplistic ways to explain UDL and how we're moving away from this one size fits all curriculum, which is that we cannot have a bunch of kids in the class like it's a 1970s dinner party and expect to serve a casserole, right? So in 1970, my meme, bless her heart, she had Sunday dinner every Sunday. And she didn't think about what does everybody like to eat? Like she made something and put it down and we all ate it. And that's kind of how school worked for a long time too. And so when you think back to 1970, if you were like a caterer, it was very casserole based. It was shepherd's pie. You know, it was chili. It was tuna noodle casserole. It was jello mold. It was like, we're all just going to put this thing together. Right. And then what we've learned over time is that when we create a casserole, okay, it is going to be inaccessible to a number of diners or, or guests, I guess you could say. And last in the last webinar, we talked about the ice cream truck. If you want to go back to that first webinar and watch the analogy ice cream truck. But the concept is, is we can't always make choices about what kids are going to get. And when we make a casserole and we give it to kids and Lucy says, gosh, like I, I literally can't access that. I'll get really sick. I can't have the dairy. I have lactose intolerance. There is a tendency to say, Lucy can't. She doesn't belong in here. She doesn't belong at this party. She can't eat it, okay? And it's not that Lucy can't. It's that I couldn't make a meal that worked for Lucy, okay? So we're looking at what is disabling about the meal, not what is disabling to Lucy. Because my goal is not actually to eat the shepherd's pie or the lasagna or the tuna noodle casserole. My goal is that Lucy has like a really wholesome meal. And if I provided her with options and choices and I basically said, you know, embrace, you know, work together. Let's come up with a menu that works for all of us. We're going to all have different options and choices. Don't worry about it. You're not all going to be expected to do the same thing. You know, be adventurous. Take a no thank you bite if you feel like you can. But what you do is when you create a casserole, it doesn't work for everybody. So then what we often do is we transition to this like kind of weird middle space where we make the casserole and then we're like, oh great, the casserole doesn't work for everybody. And then we start making individual meals for everybody, which is absolutely not sustainable and exhausting. And when you do that, what you are communicating through efficacy is, I don't believe the ch child can make a meal for themselves. And again, that's kind of hard to hear, okay? But, but being an expert learner means we allow kids to self-direct. We allow them to self-report their grades. We allow them to make choices for themselves. And when I always put a meal in front of the kid, what that is communicating is a self-fulfilling prophecy is you can't put it together yourself. Now, any child, if you ask them to make their own meal, the first couple of times, it will be a disaster, okay? Like if I let my sweet, loving, you know, children, I have three sons and a daughter, if I like let them loose to make their own meal, it would not be wholesome. But then I would be like, oh my gosh, like I am so proud of you for like making an effort. Let's talk about what you chose. Really, really great job on like the apples and the grapes. I'm a little concerned about like the three Hershey's bars, um, but I love that you went for it. I love that you went for it. Let me tell you why this might not be the best thing for you or why you might want to have it later instead, right? Eventually, if I work with them and empower them and say mistakes are okay, we're going to collaborate and work together, and I know that you have strengths eventually they're going to be able to get to a buffet and make their own meal. So we want to move away from the casserole. We want to move away from the short order cook. And we want to move towards this concept of let me put out the options and choices. Okay. All the different teaching methods, all the different teaching materials, all the possible things that could help them express what they know. And then I'm going to say, I am challenging you to make a choice. What do you think you can do? And I will never leave you alone. Okay, I'm going to give you feedback. We're going to work in collaborative pairs. We're going to come up with it. We're going to make mistakes. That's a part of the journey. And eventually, if you do that enough, kids will perform higher. They will make better choices. And again, I see this in classrooms all the time. 
um, when you can do it with very, very young learners too. And so some of the hesitation I hear sometimes is like, oh, it seems like kids would need to be older to do this. Um, what we did in my district is we really wanted to start with our youngest learners, really, really focusing on our pre-K, our K, our one, two, three, four. Um, so we could send them to middle school and high school with a really solid, um, a really solid understanding of their own personalized learning profile and how that changes based on the task. And so they can advocate for what they need and so they understand the scaffolds that are helpful and they have strong executive functioning skills and studying skills. And so we've really, really made an effort at the elementary schools to really focus on professional development in UDL. Now in the state of Massachusetts, there are over 1800 schools in the state. And of those 1800, there were only 52 schools that were noted as schools of recognition for our Department of Education, meaning that they, they exceeded, they significantly exceeded targets for growth in every single subgroup area. So we're talking your students with disabilities, your economically disadvantaged, your English language learners, okay, all students in every single subject, every single grade, every single cohort, and both of our elementary schools, our only elementary schools, were highlighted on that list. So when we give our youngest learners the power to make decisions for themselves, okay, what we see is that we're performing, and our district is not performing necessarily this high up, but in like the top 3% of the entire state. And these are kids who are literally giving ownership of their own learning. So I wanna take a stop again. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen just to check in so I can see that chat um, to see if there's any comments. Um, this concept of a culture of innovation and risk-taking, um, Oops, one second. And, and so thinking about all of this, all of the different pieces of how do we work together to create an organization where both teachers, administrators, learners are all trying, all trying to work together to create a new system where mistakes are valued and improvement is, is, is the goal. So um, anyone have any questions or anything right now? I can see that there's quite a few people on. Um, just want to make sure I'll give it another 30 seconds to see if you have any questions or comments that you'd like me to answer. Okay, so the question, were there specific strategies that you use to encourage middle school teachers to adopt UDL after implementing it in elementary grades? So that is an excellent question. Um, right now, what we did in our district is we, we, we're on year five of our UDL implementation. Um, what we did is we went much, much heavier at our elementary schools um, for a couple of reasons. One, because we could send expert learners through the system. Um, number two is because in uh, Massachusetts, elementary schools only need to have 900 hours of instruction a year, and secondary schools have 990 hours of instruction. Um, as a result, we can have more professional development time because if they're on the same teaching schedule, we can actually get like an additional few hours a month working with our elementary schools for professional development. Um, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if we really focus like 78 and a half hours a year on professional development in elementary schools, and, and that's the schedule, it's, it's two half days a month, um, plus three full days, it equates to about 78 hours. If we really spend that time focusing on what this looks like, we can, we can flip our system. Um, the way that it became a, a really great sell for middle school is a lot of those kids are now transitioning into middle school advocating for themselves. So we've provided middle school teachers with a lot of professional development. You know, I'll go into any time and model lessons. Um, they have, you know, a half day a month plus three full days to work on it. But what we're realizing is kids are literally coming up in fifth grade and being like, would it be possible for me to try this instead? I really feel like this would be valuable. And the teachers are like, uh, yeah, yeah, like absolutely. So what we have found is the teachers and the students are really working together at the middle school to actually start to really turn this around. Um, and we, we certainly had middle school teachers who are real champions for UDL, you know, who have taken every single UDL course um, with us. Another thing that we do at our district that I think works really well is we created a teacher leadership team. So there's one person in every grade from every school um, that comes to meet with us uh, for hours a month after school it is a stipended position that we ended up funding from our gift accounts actually so when we get school pictures school gets a little bit of money we use that money to create this teacher leadership group and they're kind of in charge of, of inspiring their 
their crew, their grade with all like the new best practices in UDL. So we have the ear of somebody on every team and every school um, every, every other week for two additional hours to basically say like, okay, so we want to really go heavy on self-assessment strategies. Like think about all these tools. How can you share it with your team during common planning time? So we have so many layers of professional development um, that you have colleagues who have through vicarious experience done this with significant success. Because they've done it with significant success, other teacher efficacy starts to build. Because it's like, I'm, having, I'm struggling with this student, and then a colleague's like, oh, you should try this, this is really effective. And so now it's becoming like out of control in the most beautiful and amazing ways. Um, the things that are happening in classrooms across the board, pre-K all the way to 12th grade, are really, really amazing. And it's teachers that I think are now pushing the envelope. And it's because we allow them to fail. So next year at the high school, for example, I have three wild things happening. Um, we always say if you have any innovative pilots that align to our district theory of action to create more universally designed personalized opportunities for kids, bring them forward. At the high school, I have a teacher who wants to teach a class that is 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade English open honors, which means it's eight sections in one. <laughs> so any student can sign up for it, okay? And basically, through creating their own personalized learning plans, looking at the standards, choosing their own text, their collaborative groups, their assessments, um, he's going to have eight classes in theory running simultaneously while the kids work together. Um, so, for example, if narrative writing is going to be a focus of the, the vertical strands and everyone's going to work on, let's look at a mentor text, but now you're going to choose, you know, a text in your kind of level of rigor, um, and then you're all going to craft a short story. If you want to have the honors credit, you not only have to craft the short story, but you have to teach the short story and write a literary analysis of your own story. Whereas if, you're, if you just are going for the college prep credit, you're going to be kind of a part of the class that your colleagues are creating. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, things like that it could be a total failure but I don't care because that's the culture of let's try things to see if they're successful for all kids and if they are we'll replicate and scale them and if we're not we're gonna embrace that mistake and we're gonna learn from it and we're gonna do better next time um, another question is um, any advice in terms of pitfalls to avoid when rolling out UDL that you can give in hindsight um, and and I I think that we have done a pretty, pretty good job in Grot and Dunstable um, starting small and scaling it up. And so the first year I was in Grot and Dunstable, I basically designed a graduate course and was like, who wants to learn about UDL? And I have 208 unit A uh, certified teachers in the district. And um, of them, there were like 12 of them who were like, I'll take the class. And I'm like, wow, that is really depressing. <laughs> like only 12 people want to take it. But I was like, I, those 12 people are going to be my best friends, and I'm going to make sure that they, there's no chance they're not going to be successful. Like, they're going to create lab classrooms, they're going to do PD. So I arranged to take those 12 who really wanted to do it, and I became a universally designed teacher and champion to them. Um, I made sure that I modeled lessons in their classroom. I made sure that I sent them to conferences if they needed it. Um, you know, I basically, I challenged them as the final project in the graduate course to create PD that they would give in the district. And so I had 12 champions that first year. That multiplied into 20 champions the second year. And then by the third year, I had 73 people sign up for that class. So, you know, I think that the, the implementation science really says to create um, to get to full implementation where you have more than 50% of people doing something, you're really looking at a four to seven year strategic plan. Um, I think the mistake that some districts make is thinking they can do it in a year. Um, because in order to really get teachers to believe in all kids and to learn the different strategies, um, we need to ensure that all educators and all students have the time to become expert learners and you will absolutely can make changes that first year but if you're looking to really move a system you do have to stick with it long term and in education we're not the best at sticking with things for multiple years um, and so I think that the, the commitment to see this through in the long haul it's not going away Okay. The concept of allowing personalized opportunities for all kids to learn will not go away because we have computers and apps that are wildly compliant. So I would say the pitfall is don't give up too early, embrace the mistakes, and, and be there for the long haul. Um, to go back to sharing the, uh, the screen here. 
Okay, so we're gonna move away from this concept of buffet and we are going to talk a little bit about how it's similar and different from um, differentiated instruction. Um, so essentially, if you look on that right-hand column, that's gonna be what we call casserole teaching. That is like, I'm a teacher, I'm gonna design something, I'm gonna create a curriculum, and I'm gonna just follow a script. I'm gonna teach it as it was designed. Um, this is not to say that curriculum is like a four-letter word. Okay, if you adopt a curriculum, it's a great, great resource and springboard to start from, but there's no curriculum that knows your kids. There's no curriculum that can, can believe in every kid in your room, okay? Um, it also, many curriculums don't embrace variability, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So I have a lot of curriculums that will say, do this for English language learners, as if English language learners are all the same, and they're, they're not. Um, students with ADHD are not the same. And so how do we create options and choices that truly meet the needs of all learners? And so we're not gonna do that anymore. Differentiated instruction, that center column, was very much about responding to the curriculum to make it work for kids. That's like being a short order cook. So you have your curriculum that you wanna make and then you're like, oh, it's not gonna work for this person, it's not gonna work for this person and you're very much retrofitting. It's almost like you feel like you're prepping every day for the next day for specific kids. Okay, what that does is, is that sends uh, an implicit message, okay? It's deficit-based, first of all. It's the kid can't do it. And the next part is, is I don't believe they can make better choices for themselves, okay? So when I create curriculum and I allow it to be flexible, and then I encourage kids to try things and choose and do and review, what I'm doing is UDL, which is I'm being very proactive, okay? I'm looking at my environment. I wanna create conditions of nurture. I wanna always check myself on do I have high expectations of all kids? And then I'm gonna be really intentional about taking the curriculum and ensuring that there are options and choices so kids do have personalized pathways to move forward towards a goal. And when I do that, I remove barriers as opposed to kind of avoiding barriers. Um, and this is another little short video that I like love to show. Again, it's two minutes. Um, his name is Jerry Brooks. He's a principal in Lexington, Kentucky. And he talks about throwing a differentiation party. And what's really interesting about this is his differentiation party um, uses the word differentiation, but he's actually kind of kicking back and forth between two frameworks um, because he talks about like, I want a party that everybody can come to. And so he's very proactive at first. Like, I'm going to put out all these different cups. I'm going to make sure I have all different types of food. You know, I'm going to make sure that I have this and that. And that would be like me saying, okay, I want every student to write. Okay, so the barrier might be they don't know what they're gonna write about. I'm gonna make a list of possible writing topics. Another barrier might be that they struggle with like handwriting. I'm gonna allow them to use Dragon Naturally Speaking. Another might be they don't know how to organize it. I'm gonna make sure there's exemplars and graphic organizers, right? So I'm being really proactive. I'm not thinking about specific kids. Okay, he slips in the video. He slips where he starts becoming reactive because now he's doing things for specific guests based on a label. Okay, so when you label kids and say, this is what I have to do for my English language learners only, okay, you're again, there's this assumption that they're all exactly the same and they need exactly the same things. You know, and we talked about last week, this concept of like variability, which is that like, Every English language learner, they're gonna have a different mood and different background knowledge and different temperament and different levels of language. And they're gonna have different attention spans and cognitive skills. And so it can't just be, I'm gonna do this for everyone. Now, the, the tips and scaffolds we usually are given to meet the needs of English language learners are amazing teaching strategies, but they can be available for all students. That's the shift to UDL. It's not to say that it's not great to have visuals of vocabulary and provide different options for things, but we need to provide those to every student because every student has an opportunity to make choices to challenge and support themselves. So what I want you to do is listen in this video for where he slips, okay? Now, some people get caught up on like, oh, there's all these different cups and you know, what if I didn't want that cup? Well, that's fine, because if I put out a bunch of different graphic organizers, you might say, you know what, Novak, I really want to try to do it without a graphic organizer. I've used it the last three times. I didn't find it super helpful. I almost felt like it was a waste of time. I just want to see how I do without it. Is that cool? I would say 100%. 100% that's cool with me. 
Okay. And then afterwards, I'd probably check in after 15 minutes. How are you feeling like you're doing? Do you miss the graphic organizer? Like, are you visualizing it in your head? Tell me what's going on. And those conversations, I believe, I believe in kids. I believe in their trial and error. And so again, watch this. The goal is where does he move from UDL, which is proactively planning to differentiated instruction where he's going to label guests and then make decisions for them. I've just come from my favorite store, the Dollar Tree, and I have some suggestions for a party. If you would like to have some educators over to your house this summer, they got some great ideas. They got these pineapple cups, these coconut cups. You could have a Hawaiian theme party, but I have an even better suggestion that's going to blow your mind. You can get these great cups at the Dollar Tree, and I know what you're thinking. That's just a red Solo cup. Let me show you something. Boom. They have a different size. Wait one more time. Boom. Differentiation party. You can meet the needs of all your party goers. Some people just need a regular size drink. Some people don't need that much to drink. Some people need a big old drink. You can meet the needs of all your party goers with these great red solo cup from the Dollar Tree. Think about all the possibilities at your differentiation party. You can differentiate the food. You could have some wings, some barbecue wings, a little bit spicy. For those that don't like spice, you could have some honey barbecue wings. For those that need some extra spice, you could have some of them five alarm Tabasco wings. You could differentiate the heat in your wings. You could have some meatballs and you could meet the needs of those that don't eat red meat by having turkey balls. And you can meet your party goers needs by having some tofu balls for those that are vegetarians. You can even differentiate your dip. You can make one of them seven layer dips with the refried beans and the salsa and the onions and cheeses. You can differentiate, make a six layer dip, maybe leave out the onions. Then you can make an eight layer dip, maybe add some extra festive cheese. You could even differentiate the time of your party. You could have your party from seven to nine, invite all the fun people from seven to nine, but you could actually invite the wild crazy people from six to nine because they can handle some extra time. Then you could just invite the fun people a little bit boring that can't handle a big old long party. You could do them from eight to nine. You could even differentiate the time of your party. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things you can do at your differentiation party. Starting out with these great cups from the dollars trees. Go out, you get you some. You're going to be the talk of all the teachers at your differentiation party. Okay. So, um, again, I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to see – do any of you have any sense of like where he switches it to being rather judgmental and labeling his guests and making decisions for them as opposed to letting the, the guests make decisions for themselves? Any ideas, any guesses? I'll give it another minute just in case any of you are typing feverishly. So it's a really, really subtle shift. And so when he's talking about, I'm going to put out all the food, again, it might be like, maybe you're not hungry. Maybe you don't need the exemplars or the graphic organizers or the dragon, naturally speaking. And Emily nailed it. Emily, oh my gosh, Emily. And then who's the second person you are all on fire? Regina, amazing. It's, it's when he, oh my gosh, you're all princesses in it. You're all killing it. This is what's happening is, I have decided you're boring and therefore you can only come from six to seven. And the reality is, is you feel that as a learner, you feel it. And when I say all of you need to come over here and work on this, as opposed to, I want to give you an opportunity to self-reflect, look at how you did on the last assessment, make a really good choice about how you're going to remediate the fact if you didn't do that well. One option is to come over here with me in a small group. Another option is to do this. We choose, we do, we review. And that's what UDL is really about. But to do that, again, I have to, number one, have high expectations for kids. I have to believe that all kids can make good decisions for themselves. I have to also embrace the fact that they might make bad decisions and I'm going to let them micro fail for their macro success. Okay, I'm not going to let them do it over and over again, but if they choose not to be with me and then they struggle on the next informal assessment the next day, I'm going to sit down and say, okay, what I really need you to do is I need you to come with me tomorrow to see if it's helpful. Okay. And I'm going to give you another choice to do it next week, but let's just see if I can help you out here. Cause you didn't choose to, to be with me and you chose to watch the video, but I think you're still struggling. So I want to help you out here. And, and that means that I have to have the belief in myself that I'll know the right feedback to give 
that I am going to be able to kind of manage all these different things happening at once. And you build that through professional development in a system to create teacher capacity and competency. So like, this is why we really have to think about an action plan for how are we going to provide the options and the choices for educators to learn how to meet the needs of all students. So this last section here, as we're talking about, okay, so we understand UDL and how it's different from differentiated instruction and how it builds on that. I wanna review really quick. Again, UDL is all about the fact that we want students to make their own choices, to follow through with those choices. And then our trump card, where we're really, really gonna focus is in the review part. And the review part is where you can recognize that you've made a mistake, that you didn't take, make the right choice, um, that the strategy didn't work for you. And, you're gonna do it better next time. You're gonna get feedback during the review process, not only from your own self-reporting of those grades and self-assessment, which we know works really great for Hattie, it's also gonna be us providing feedback to students and peers providing feedback to each other, which again, very, very high yield strategies when you're looking at visible learning for teachers. Okay, feedback is very, very high up. I was showing you the top three, but things like collaborative discussion, cooperative learning, and feedback are also much, much higher than 0.4, and therefore they're strategies we really wanna focus on. How do we make effective choices? Okay, during that review process, this is again from Mike Anderson's book. I'm going, I'm still sticking with this buffet analogy. Okay, we put out a buffet. We say, I have high expectations for all of you. Before we start, think about the barriers that are going to prevent you from making a good decision. Really think about it. You guys know, I know you can all meet this goal. And if you can already meet it, I want you to surpass it. That's about the conditions of nurture. I believe that you can all learn. I believe I can help you learn. We might have to work together. Give me feedback. I'll give you feedback. But when you're in this, this, uh, this reflection piece, what you want to do is you want to first of all say, what am I interested in doing? But that needs to be balanced very carefully with what do I need to work on in order to meet the goal? And that's really tough for kids because if I put out a bunch of options and one of those options is like watch a video with a partner and another option is sit with the teacher and get help, I might be very interested in watching a video with my partner, but I actually know that I need to work with a teacher in order to understand that. And those are conversations that we have to say, you know what, a lot of times I would really, really like during a meeting to be on my phone. Okay, I would love it. I would love to look at Facebook on my phone. However, I know that I need to pay attention. And so what I have to do is I have to put it away. Okay, I'm not interested in putting it away, but I need to put it away. So asking students at the beginning, what are you interested in, but what do you need? Look at your grades, look at your assessments, look at your strengths, look at what you're trying to work on. Okay, what do you need to do? And then logistically, is it available to you? So let's say, for instance, that you provide the option for kids to work on an iPad and you have like six of them and there's like 27 kids. They can't all choose it, period, end of story. And so the truth is, is in life, I need to work with what I have. So I need to think, what am I interested in? What do I need to do to reach this goal that I wanna reach? And then I have to be resourceful logistically with what I have. Now, certainly I can give feedback to try to get more resources the next time, but this concept of like growth mindset and being a problem solver and being flexible and being gritty is again, we have to take action and help students to really think about what's the best choice for you Always going back to, I have high expectations that you will make good decisions. I believe in you. I know your strengths. I know you can do this. And that relationship building and those conditions of nurture are huge, huge drivers and foundational requirements for really creating a robust universally designed system. So again, this concept of variability is really important because what we know is that we can't make choices for all students and recognize their variability. We generally choose one. I'm gonna take all the kids right now who have low shoulders. I'm gonna take all the kids right now who are really tall. Um, and, and the better option is to say, think about where you're at and what do you need? Now in a multi-tiered system we talked about last time, there may still be times where differentiated instruction is necessary, but that is gonna be in addition to universally designed tier one and not instead of. So no one loses the opportunity to have high expectations to make robust choices. In addition to that, some students may need more intervention, but again, the better we are at tier one, the less intervention we have to provide for tier two and tier three. 
And so I just wanted to take a minute to think about my own variability to kind of reflect really quickly on, you know, the fact that you could put me in a group of students, you could group me however you wanted. So you could say, you know, maybe I'm a struggling reader. Um, you know, maybe I did really, really well on a test. Maybe I'm well behaved. And so I end up in some certain group. But the reality is, is I'm all over the place if you look at a cognitive profile. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about comparing me to like most adults, um, my memory is like impeccable. Like I can remember what I was wearing like the first day of fifth grade. If I read a book, I know where the quote is. Like I know, oh, it'll be like on the second to last line on a page. Okay, so I'm excellent with memory. My attention span, as you can probably imagine, if you've ever met me or seen me on this, is quite short. <laughs> and so like I need options and choices for like really quick switching off um, I need to be able to have options to like get up and to move and to take breaks and to talk or you will lose me. Okay. And I'll still be compliant. I'll still be well behaved. But like, if you think about this concept of students with ADHD or students who are English learners or, you know, students who are struggling in math and this concept is, well, I'll just make a casserole for them. You still have variability. Unless you're working with one child, there will be variability. Um, and even with one child, you might have mood variability from day to day. And so this concept of UDL, again, is thinking about like we first need to make sure we have high expectations for all kids, period, end of story. The next thing is, is we have to make sure that we have high expectations for our ability to teach all kids. That is the job. We need to teach all kids. Our job is not to teach kids who arrive ready to learn. Our job is not to teach only special education students. Our job is not only to teach gifted students. We have to teach all students. When we do that together with collective efficacy and we co-plan and we co-serve and all kids have tier one instruction with you know, content area experts, um, what we end up with is kids who start to believe in the power of learning because all kids are capable of learning. They start to believe that there is a way for them to be successful, okay? And then they recognize that people who they look up to, who they think like, wow, like she's, you know, she's bright. She has an awesome memory. Then you start going, wow, like she really, she, her attention span is like a squirrel. That's something I'm really good at that she's not. So charting variability amongst staff and administrators and as kids, allows everyone to realize that every single person can self-differentiate. If we know ourselves and we understand where we need to end up, and we're gonna talk about this a lot more in the third webinar, is how do you start to create those options for methods and materials and assessments? But the reality is in a universally designed class, all students have the opportunity to make choices about their learning in a way that is self-differentiated. It is not differentiated by the teacher in a tier one inclusive environment. And when we do this, we end up with students who are expert learners, okay? Students who obviously have learned to read and write and they have other knowledge that they need to be an educated person, okay? But, but that's not it. That's actually very little of what's gonna make all our kids successful in the future. What's more important is that they learn how to to learn, that they learn life skills like how to work together, okay, conditions of nurture is collaboration, to be self-directed by making choices, being flexible while always thinking about their interests and their needs and the logistics, and they have to do that in a way that technology is often available to them because the reality is, is that's the future that we're preparing them for. So when we don't have high expectations for all kids, when we don't give them options and choices to choose their goals and methods and materials and work together with classmates who are very, very different from them. If we don't do that and we are always short order cooking, okay, we have literally stolen the opportunity for kids to learn how to learn, innovate, develop life skills and be productive and accountable because I am always doing it for them. I'm solving their problems by giving them what they need, okay? I'm the one being flexible and creative by creating these accommodations, and I'm directing them. They don't have to do anything except for be compliant, and that's a very, very low bar to be successful in the future. So again, that's the focus of the webinar today, this concept of how teacher efficacy and high expectations for students drives us to create conditions of nurture where we really focus on the possibility of every kid becoming a learner by empowering them and respecting them enough to give them options and choices and numerous opportunities to learn what it means to learn and to get to know themselves as learners so ultimately we can create a classroom where they are self-reporting their grades and they are collaborating with each other and they are advocating for themselves to create a system that works for them. 
So um, I'm going to stop the share now. I know we only have two minutes left in this webinar, and I just want to see um, if anybody has any questions that I could answer in this last couple of minutes. Fast and furious. This is a fast and furious hour, and I know there's a lot in there, but again, as last time, I will follow up with some additional resources and will encourage you to, you know, definitely reach out with questions, you know, have me look at your strategic plans or lessons, um, and I'm happy to collaborate in any way. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Novak. That was wonderful. Very inspiring. And if that didn't inspire all our participants, then I don't know what will. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Um, just to note that we will be having part three of this webinar series on December 6th. So we are going to skip the weeks for Thanksgiving break and we will join on the other side on December 6th. We will be posting the recorded version of this webinar on our website and also on our social media outlets, YouTube and such. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to post them or to reach out to Dr. Novak uh, directly, very generously. She's put her email there. So thank you, everyone, um, and have a great Thanksgiving break. Bye.